Hey guys, this will be video 7 for the uh, Les Paul restoration. Uh, it's probably going to be a fairly long video and uh, I'm going to go into a lot of uh, topics that are probably going to be the first half mostly uh, related to construction and um, craftsmanship and tooling and, and tools and how to use certain uh, uh, drill bits and hole saws and things like that so it, it so it may be a little bit boring on the front end but I'm gonna try to take this video and transition into the threshold that, that we've just crossed and now let's back up punt you know maybe think about uh, options and things like that N not not for this guitar uh, this this owner and me as the builder repair guy we got a clear-cut view as to where we're going again I reiterate that this video is also for the guys that are building their own projects so uh, you know, I don't want anybody to panic. Go, oh God, no! I don't want to. I don't want to make that change, or I don't want to do that, or I wouldn't do that. I'm just saying, hey, some of us like a Bigsby, and some of us don't. So I'm not going to talk about Bigsby anymore. But I just make that statement to reiterate: um, we're at a threshold now, and we can start making changes if we want to to uh, better fit the playing uh, style that we we all have. So I'm going to start and I'm going to be kind of reading from a list. Uh, first off, I'm going to start discussing the tailpiece studs uh, and the anchors and the repairs that I made again. And some of you might be saying, well, you've already talked about that. Well, no, I've, I've done some more work to that and I want to discuss that in more as well as some of the discoveries I made. And look at this discoloration right here how it might relate to what caused that uh, mahogany to fail and to rot out. And then I'm going to talk about the body repair where, I, where I've uh, uh, got that to this point. It's not completely finished, but it's very close. Uh, and then I, I'm going to discuss the maple fitment a little bit more. Not a lot, but it, it, I'll, I might discuss that as far as like how I would do some of the clamping. Uh, and then we're going to do some tap tone analysis between this guitar and this guitar. Now that this is actually turning into a guitar and everything's reconnected, it, it's amazing how much that one little bit of material right there affects the, 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 the transference of the tone in the body. So we'll do some tap tone analysis. And then I hope I remember to discuss why the binding is still on the body i hope I, I hope i don't forget that but i don't want to start talking about it right now or why i didn't just uh uh you know go guns loaded into the project and get all that stuff out of the way it's old and broken right we're not going to use it right well, not necessarily you might be surprised what you can work with and the more we can keep it historical historically accurate and uh, in keeping with what's original the better so i kind of went ahead and spent a little bit more info with that in case i do forget to talk about it uh i'm going to be mentioning a guy by the name of keith williams five watt world and his uh, video series i'm uh, sorry on the les paul and on the les paul as well as uh the, the the gibson line incredible series most of you guys out there already know who that is and have have um seen his videos but and i'll tie it to one of his particular videos about kind of what, what this is kind of like the ripple in the pond of les pauls of what this guitar really is and then uh, i'll talk a little bit about new construction versus restoration so i know that was a bit of a, a long intro but i wanted to hit those points so now i can just kind of rock it through from a technical standpoint so let's dive right in uh, the tailpiece studs, you know, I talked about how it was weird. I found some rotted material here, the, the mahogany, and I've already discussed how, you know, I wanted to make those repairs with what I would kind of call a sacrificial wood it, or scrap wood. You put the wood in, but only because you're going to drill out 80% of it and you only want the 20% back here in the back to remain. Uh, it fills those voids, but what I got to thinking about and I'm not going to start talking about saltwater climates and South Florida and boats, but I had a 1973 uh, post sport Fisher 
yacht. This was like a 40 foot long boat and I restored it. It took a long time, but I, I learned the importance about what, what, what really makes up wood. And I'm not going to go into lignin and all of these things, but I am going to briefly mention a guy by the name of David Pascoe, P-A-S-C-O-E. If you get a chance and you want to know a more about wood than you can imagine. David Pascoe was a marine surveyor from, I think, like back in the 60s and all through the 70s, and I think he passed in the 90s. But his understanding of... Um, uh, I'm having to just read my notes here. Basically, stray current, galvanism, electrolysis, uh, oxygen starvation and how dissimilar metals against wood, how they start reacting once you put current to them. We're talking electrical current. So again, if you want to do some studying, look up uh, an article, um, Dave Pascoe, or David Pascoe, uh, galvanic, uh, galvanic corrosion, electrolysis, uh, stray current, and you'll trip up on my article that's going to blow your mind. And I think that might be what happened here. And I'm just going to hit this briefly. When Let's say this guitar was in an extremely moist climate for the bulk of its life. We well, got all this moisture building up just from the air uh, around that anchor and around that wood. And day in, day out, plug it into the amplifier. We've, now we have current, and we and we all know about the ground wire. How you you know some people need to ground to you need to ground to the anchor, or either the the bridge studs. So when you're when you're looking at uh, was there a poor ground, was there a weak ground, or maybe it wasn't even grounded at all. And and there be, and then start, what happens then is you start getting a stray current that that is trying to travel out of that. Uh, anchor and where does it go it goes into the wood and once it hits the wood if that wood is moist it'll go as far as the wood will allow it but it usually uh, dissipates fairly quickly so i'm going to stop talking about that other than to say it will cause mahogany to rot when i was restoring my my boat uh, i couldn't believe i found this old beautiful vintage mahogany rotted out like pine because it had been for decade after decade continually attacked by the electrolysis and the galvanic corrosion between dissimilar metals, whether it was stainless against aluminum, uh, uh, silicone bronze, all sorts of things. So I'm gonna stop on that. But if you want to get, if you want to really geek out about these things, check out that article. Now, I think this is important. I'm glad I remembered. Uh, I mentioned, oh yeah, you got to go in there and you got to find out what's wrong and this that, and the other. I'm not saying cut off the top of your Les Paul to determine whether your anchors are bad. What what I am saying, if if you if you had, you know, your maple top here, but you notice that you're having major problems with tuning stability, and and you even get to looking at it and maybe your the studs are tilted forward, and that's exactly what happened here. The, the, where the depth of this anchor goes through the maple and where it went into the, to, to, to the mahogany, that at the very bottom was exactly the mahogany that was deteriorated. And it was apparently, you know, all of the stress was in the maple. So what I'm saying, what you might have to do is have your uh, repair shop come in and, and determine what size, uh, what size, hole this is supposed to be remove the tails studs and the anchors and simply drill out all the way down obviously not through the body but you know drill down till you find fresh um, um, shavings coming out and when you're drilling that when i was drilling and cleaning some of that out the shavings that were coming out they look like what you would find in the bottom of an ashtray it was it was amazing so you could drill that out and then have a mahogany uh, plug put in there, epoxy it in, and then re and then after that plug's in there, then re put it on the drill press, re-drill it again, and now put your anchor back in, and voila, you have just 
solved, you know, um, 40 years of deterioration from sweat, beer, moisture in the air, saltwater climate, you know, living in South Florida for 25 years or maybe uh, in a real damp uh, Louisiana, you know, um, uh, area or something like that. So uh, again, I probably talked too long about that, but, but, you know, that's kind of what I meant by you got to go in there on the front end and deal with this extremely boring crap that it doesn't matter how pretty the guitar is after the fact. Um, we don't want a beautiful disaster. And last thing you want is the guy, the client to say, you know, six months from now say, yeah, you know, everything's great, but I just, it just, I'm having tuning problems and you, you, you wouldn't know what, what was causing it. Or you might fear that, oh my God, the neck that I built might be failing, which I don't think that's going to happen I, I, because I know my moisture content's perfect and my glue is perfect, but that would be one of those things that would be the problem, but you would never, ever have suspected unless you read some of those articles or, disco or discovered that stuff. So anyway, again, that was probably way too much information, but, but you know, for the tuning stability, very critical. All right, uh, the body repair. Uh, I'm just going to read off my list. Multi-piece repair versus one piece, like one large piece of mahogany glued in. And then I'm going to talk about reverse drilling with the hole saw. And then uh, as you're doing, as you are doing that drilling at that point, sanding and jigsaw work or bandsaw work, uh, you're going to hear the body come alive or begin to, to start coming alive just by the machining and the handling. So even though I just read that, now let's flip it over and talk about my reasoning for the, the way I made this repair. Uh, if I had have had the one solid big chunk of mahogany, and even if it had been 90% intact, would have changed everything. But you will recall from the past videos it was broken on about a, uh, well, it's a 33 degree angle, I already know. Uh, but it was broken on a pretty sharp angle. And I did not want to go in and start. It would have been so simple to have put this thing on a sled and, and made one straight line cut and just cut the whole damn bottom of the belt off. Would have been a walk in the park. And glue it up on there and and finish the job and if you're a production luthier that's pretty much the only choice you've got because you do not have time to sit here for a day and a half uh, building up pieces but what I was able to achieve by doing this this way this multi-piece is I was able to maintain every bit of the original wood if you look at that bottom angle I didn't change any of that I only leveled off maybe um, a couple of millimeters uh, not even an eighth of an inch and was able to maintain as much of the original body as possible so uh, was it easy hell no it was it was extremely intensive um, this to start it out this is one block right here and I made sure that that block came over enough so that my second piece my second laminate would be thick enough to cover the curvature of the the route you know how we have like the the floor the the, the weird twisted arrangement that where the the pots go in so 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 the first piece goes in epoxy and and dry it overnight and then you got to walk away second piece there's um second piece i might have to look over the phone because i can't see through the phone uh, there's a second piece right here and a third piece right here and believe it or not there's a fourth and a fifth piece here even though number four and five look like one piece uh, and what that allowed me to do is and i actually put black tint in the epoxy so that you would would actually see the lines um what that allowed me to do is assure that this is probably going to be a better better view of 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 everything see how that assured that I was able to do one at a time get a base and then once I got that second piece 
once I got that second piece glued in, guess what I have? I have a flat surface. Now I got something to clamp to as I, as I add the pieces out here. With it on an angle, how the hell are you going to cut one piece on a 30 degree slope and then put have any sort of clamping force at all that keeps it from slipping or, or twisting or, or slipping forward or slipping back? A very, very difficult repair unless you just put it on a sled, flip this thing upside down, take a table saw and just cut the whole lower bout off. Uh, in hindsight, uh, would I do this again? Yep, I would um, because I know how... Listen, I, I know that may sound silly, but just that little bit of handling, I, it now I can hear it as a part of the body. It's so well connected. It's not a, it is a repair, but it's kind of like what I mentioned by using the epoxy. It's one piece now. It's epoxy together. It might as well be, you know, and I'll do tap times later. It might as well be one piece. So I think I, I think I had a good point. I think I drove that home. Uh, the reason the outside is so visually clear is that very last one out there, I didn't use the epoxy. I used the, the tight bond. And you can see if you were doing this body where it had to be stain grade, then I would not use the epoxy because the epoxy has a tendency to show more, more reveal. But I would use the tight bond, but I'd have to make sure that I built some sort of jig to hold the body, yet would allow my clamps to not slip and twist. And I don't know if you've ever, any well, anybody that's ever done cabinet work, you're working with boxes. That's easy to keep under control. But when you start trying to do cabinet grade type clamping on a on a compound radius and arch top, hell, it's almost impossible to find an anchor point without driving your um, um, clamp into the body and doing damage. If anything, uh, it's very we're very fortunate that this body is kind of banged up and the owner wants a, a relic job because just doing the job it's automatically getting relic a little bit as you're working with it so okay on that note uh i think i drove that home so you can see it looks like wow it's kind of is it sloppy no it's not sloppy is that epoxy right there no that's a little bit of black paint left from the body and i was doing everything i could to leave some of this black paint but you get to a point where you have to draw a line and you gotta make sure that, um, you know, that, that you got things like this right here. You know, you, 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 and you can't, just, you can't get that squareness unless you relieve that paint and get it out of the way. And then you're able to, to you know, go around the body from the back primarily, but from, from the front as well. Uh, and make sure that you're square. Well, make sure you're square off the corners. What I'm saying. Um, again, do the same thing up on the front. So and you're making sure that everything's real square. And it did. It turned. I should have done this view. It turned out really well from that respect. Curvatures are there. Compound radius turns. French curves. Whatever you want to call them. It's there. You know. It's beautiful. Turned out really good. Okay. Uh, how did I drill that? Because see, that was solid. Uh, see, see where this, I have to look over the phone. Okay. See that point right there? Obviously it was one piece all the way down. That was one piece all the way down and, it, and you just barely could see the edge of the original opening. Uh, let's see, I'll have to flip it to the other side to show this. Okay, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't have the camera. Again, I, I need a helper for this. This is not that easy to do with, with camera. I'll try to slow down. Uh, they were able to drill the uh, wiring channel through this hole, even though this hole is not in line with that hole. This hole is large enough that they were able to drill that wherever they wanted to but where I'm going with this is let's see if I can turn this around what I had remaining was that little bit of black right there okay and that, and that black was all I needed to uh, assess where the uh, w the angle relationship of the uh, 
jack hole in relation to the body. Is it on this angle? Is it on that angle? Is it down here? Is it up here? And with that little bit of material left, I was able to determine uh, where I was. Now, you're thinking, how in the world do you, do you drill? Sorry. How do you drill this out here and, and get it and make sure that you hit that original material? Again, like I mentioned earlier, you're trying to figure out how to do this repair so even the best tech would have a hard time determining, wow, where, where did he start or where did he stop? So, let me get set up here. This is pretty important. And again, this is really, this is probably boring to any guitar player. This is the last thing you want to know. But uh, those of us, you know, behind the chisel, behind the, the drill, behind the, the tool, we want to figure out how to do this in a way, you know, if we want to do it with a hole saw, but without building a jig to keep that saw under control, you're probably going to make a mistake and you're going to tear the hell out of the wood. So you're thinking, okay, well, there's no way I can get a drill in there. I need to be drilling from the other side, but there's no way I can get my drill to fit in there. So what do you do? Let me show you. You take the hole saw, put a rod through it. I got a lock nut on the inside. I could, I could, even if, even if the top was on this, I could drop this in from the cavity, put it where I want it. I have to drill a pilot hole. I will say, I don't know, well, this is 3 8 so it needs to be a little bit greater than 3 8 and pretty close to center. But then, uh, then you stick this rod through in here, you connect everything, tighten this nut, and then you put the, put everything on a clamp on a solid surface. And you clamp it down so it does not move. And then if you have to, set up a jig, something like this right here, you know, build a jig to help assure that your drill bit stays perfectly where you want it see what i'm saying and that if you had to i just eyeballed this and because i was I, I could feel back here that i was up against that round on the inside and then what you do you put the drill in reverse and you start drilling through and you start pulling the drill towards you as you come out of the guitar body now before i forget this is critical you don't you don't panic when you commit to this you better finish it keep the speed of the drill fairly high and do not pull with any force because the last thing you want to do is be going slow and pulling as soon as you come out of this body it will tear the devil out of that it'll i mean it will literally chip out to the point where you'll be doing a repair and so you got to be going at fairly high speed and then and, and you'll see it it'll start easing through it's gonna you know start coming through on the bottom first don't get excited and slow down and think you're finished just keep the speed up and keep coming through and then pull pull it on out at that point uh now where's my other tool oh i've lost it almost lost it okay now you can take any sort of round anything a piece of pipe a piece of pvc anything round i got lucky on this it's real close so now you, you can wrap it sorry sorry about the camera work but you wrap it and now you can go up in there and you can start shaping and getting it cleaned up and the the beauty and i'm i'm not exact i'm not kidding when i say this um that looks like it was done with a with a router that was done with a hole saw and those of us out there that have ever worked with hole saws, they're a nightmare to stay clean. So I was able to come through that mahogany with a beautiful clean exit. Uh, is it perfect on the inside? Pretty darn close. Pretty darn close. Still needs a little bit of shaping. I don't, I don't know if I can get a view from in here. Uh, let's see. Pretty close. And see what's funny? Let's see if I can get the camera up here. I wish I had a pointer. I need a pointer. Um, 
I'm gonna have to look over the camera, so bear with me. That little piece right there on the left, see that see that line where the where the discoloration? Even that little piece right there got added after every bit of this work was done. The, I'm sorry, uh, the, this board went flat all the way out. There was a flat in there, and then I was able to slide that wedge in there, and it was fat, it was overkill. There was a lot of excess uh, sacrificial wood, and then once I, once I reverse drilled it, it, it literally caught that. See, it, it rode over, he, over here on this side, and then it cut out that side. Anyway, I think by now, even a novice would understand what I just explained, but most of us don't know about reverse drilling with a hole saw in, in a pulling fashion rather than a pushing fashion. And, 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 and like I said, if you can do that on a guitar, you can do that in anything. You can do that in furniture work. So if you guys are doing some furniture repair, that, that's a, a real cool way to do uh, furniture repair. Then you could go in with uh, hidden nuts and fasteners, et cetera, et cetera, or, or dowel rods. All right, so we talked about multi-piece versus one piece. Sorry, I'll try to get, keep it a light on if I can. Uh, we talked about, uh, I'm not gonna talk too much about one piece other than I already mentioned. Before in one of the videos, if I had have had that complete one piece, absolutely I would have glued it back in. And even if there was a void in there, the epoxy would have filled it what I couldn't, couldn't get to fit. So that covers that. Um, reverse drilling, and, and I guess what I'm, oh, what I failed to mention, as I started drilling this, or when you start running the jigsaw around here and you're cutting off this uh, mass excess material, uh, it's amazing. You start hearing the guitar singing and ringing. It, it literally almost needed to put in earplugs when I was jigsawing that. I don't use a bandsaw much, and I don't want to get into explaining that, but I like my, I like my DeWalt jigsaw. It's incredible. I can cut through a two and a quarter inch piece of mahogany, and it stay damn near perfectly 90 degrees. It's an incredible jigsaw. So I was able to jigsaw that about an eighth inch big, <laughs> not up to finished. All this was done on the orbital sander, you know, per, per a template for my template right there. But as I was doing all this machine work and this sanding and this and this handling, uh, it's one of the things I recall from Robert Benedetto talking about is you're carving a top. And you're beginning, as you're even pushing the chisel, you'll, you'll hear the guitar top begin to come alive. And it's amazing. The guitar will tell you when it's, when it's ready or when it's a musical instrument. And I know that sounds kind of romantic and, and sweet, but I'm serious, it's amazing. You, you can tell when it, when it starts becoming part of the guitar and when it's in its uh, correct shape. So, all right, uh, maple fitment, tap tone analysis and work around that. Yeah, I'll talk about the maple fitment uh, just very briefly. I'm not gonna get into major detail with this, but hear that? As you're, as you're beginning to handle this, and I, if that was loud, you've already been warned about the earbuds. So, uh, as you're, it's like a turkey call. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's coming alive. Okay, what I was going to say, I'm so sorry, I really wasn't watching the camera. I apologize for that. Uh, what I did do, I got it to a point to where everything's lined up. I verified again. And what you can do, you can, I don't have a straight edge here. That's crazy. After you've got this, this one in place, just lay the straight edge on there. See how there's a, there's a, a 